Lazarus was who had been dead, whom he had raised from the dead. There they made him a supper, and Martha served, but Lazarus was one of those who sat at the table with him. Then Mary took a pound of very costly oil of spikenard, anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the fragrance of the oil. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, who would betray him, said, Why was this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? This, he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the money box, and he used to take what was put in it. But Jesus said, Let her alone, for she has kept this for the day of my burial. O. Henry wrote a story that's really one of my favorites simply because it really talks about the expense of love. There was a young couple named Della and Jim. Each had a unique possession in life that they truly valued. Della, her most precious thing that she loved was her hair. It was long. It was so long that when she would let it down, it could literally drape around her whole body like she was wearing a robe. Jim had a prized pocket watch that had belonged to his great-grandfather. This watch was beautiful. Decorated and engraved with scenes of nature. He loved this watch. On the day before Christmas, this young couple that had been married for quite a while, they had exactly $1.87 between them. Each couldn't stand the thought of not having a present to give to their mate on Christmas Day. So Del, doing the only thing that she could do, she went out. She had all of her hair cut off. And she sold it. With the proceeds, she went to a local jewelry store and she bought a beautiful little gold chain on which Jim, her husband, could attach his prized pocket watch. Jim came home from work that night, and when he looked at the face of his wife, he was totally dumbfounded. Standing before him was the same face that he knew every line and every wrinkle, and he loved her. But she was literally shaved, almost bald headed. All of that long, beautiful hair was gone. She looked still lovely to him. And he told her how beautiful she still was. Slowly, she handed her his gift. His gift for her was an expensive tortoiseshell comb edged with multiple colors of jewelry that he had sold his pocket watch for so she could wear this beautiful set of breaths in her hair. He had sold his gold watch to buy them for the love of his life. She saved, shaved her hair to buy him a gold chain for his watch that he no longer had because he had sold the watch to buy her 
the breadth for her long hair that she no longer had. Each had given to each other the most expensive thing that they had owned. Barely clearly, this was love at its highest and most beautiful moment. The dominant feeling that you get when you read this account we just read upon our board a few moments ago, this act of love and devotion by this woman named Mary is one of the best examples in the Bible of somebody giving Jesus everything that they have. The most valuable thing that they own. This event occurred in the last week of Jesus' earthly life. Jesus had been invited to a home to come to celebrate a meal. It was given in his honor. As a matter of fact, this meal is taking place at the home of someone called Simon the leper. Now we're not really sure who Simon the leper is. It evidently is somebody that Jesus had encountered during his earthly ministry who had been afflicted by leprosy, whose body had been healed. And as an act of uh, respect, he's invited Jesus and some of Jesus' closest friends to come be with him. There are at least three people there in this home that we all know. There's Mary, there's Martha, and there's Lazarus. We all know the story of Lazarus. Lazarus was a man Jesus loved, but he died. He had already been buried for about three days before Jesus ever even showed up. When Jesus shows up at the tomb of where his body is, the people says, you better not go too near the tomb because he stinked. In other words, his body was already in a state of decay. Jesus orders the stone to be removed from the entrance of the tomb. He literally speaks just a few words. Lazarus, come forth. Instead of wrapped in his grave clothes, he comes forth out of the tomb. No longer dead, but alive. And here we see Jesus during his, literally, the last few hours of his earthly life, he is enjoying a meal with Mary, Martha, Lazarus, and Simon the leper. And his disciples is also standing around there. As they're in the process of enjoying this time of fellowship, an unusual event takes place. Mary goes and gets in, out of her possession her bag something that's very expensive. It is a bottle of precious perfume. Now it costs 300 denarii. This thing is worth a year's wages. I've seen some expensive perfume, but I've never bought a bottle that would cost me a year's wages. How about you? This is a precious commodity. She comes, sits down at the feet of Jesus. She begins to weep. As she begins to weep, her tears are falling upon the dusty feet of Jesus. The tears from her eyes is washing away the dirt that's on his feet. She takes her hair and she uses it as a towel to wipe the feet of Jesus. She opens up the bottle of this fragrant perfume and its aroma filled the entire house. She begins to pour this oil all over the feet of Jesus. She uses her hair and she rubs it all in. What a 
person would come to your house, no matter who it was that would come to your door, and they would knock, and you would open the door, there were three things you had to do for your guest. Three. One, you would get a basin of water. Two, you would wash their feet. Three, you would dry their feet. Four, you would give them a kiss of greeting on each side of their face. The last thing you would do would be to anoint their head with oil, which was a sign of God's blessings resting upon the life of that guest who was about to enter their home. You did this for every guest. Simon has invited Jesus. When Simon greeted Jesus at the door and Jesus came in, notice what he did not do. He gave what? Any water? No. Did he wash his feet for him? No. Did he give him a kiss of greeting? No. Did he anoint his head with oil for a blessing? No. He showed total disregard for Jesus. A lack of respect for Jesus. Did not pay any honor to Jesus. And we know that Jesus had to have touched him. He's had to be healed. He's no longer living in the trash dump. He's been restored. He's a member of society now. People is visiting his home and how much gratitude has he expressed to Jesus for the things that Jesus has done for him? Nothing. As Mary is washing the feet of Jesus, even one of Jesus' disciples, Judas, asked Jesus a question. Why are you allowing her to use this expensive perfume just to wash your feet when it could have been sold and we could have given the money to the poor? I want you to know something. The objective of extravagant love is to express itself to the love of without counting the when you and I love somebody, truly love, we really usually just don't sit around and think about what's this relationship going to cost? What all am I going to have to do? You never love while you're counting cost. Love never counts the cost. Mary of Bethany did not count the cost of her gift to Jesus. She simply gave it to Jesus out of love. As a parent, have you ever really counted how many times you had to get up in the middle of the night to get your kid a drink of water? Or how many noses you've had to wipe? How many times you've had to tuck them in? How many times you've had to go buy pairs of shoes because they tore the toes out of the shoes, knees out of the pants? How many times they cried? Talk about the tummy ache. Have you ever really kept a track on how many things you've done for each of your kids? A wife, if she loves her husband, loves her family, never count the number of dishes she's had to wash or how many socks she's had to find because they weren't made in the oven. She's never kept track of how many floors she slept She's never kept track of how many meals she's had to prepare. She never counts the cost. Why is it then that sometimes we Christians think about all the things it cost us for us to serve God? We think about how many meals, how many hours, how much money, you know, with our service to God, what it cost us really shouldn't make much of a difference. 
The main thing is that we have the heart and the love to express our feelings to God in acts of service and devotion. Do you think Jesus ever sat down one time and asked himself, what's it really going to cost me to save these people? God sees you before you was ever created. Before you ever drew your first breath, God knew everything about you. All the good, all the bad. The happy, the sad, the up, the down, the shortcomings, the failure, the words, the thoughts, the deeds, and he loved us anyway. As he is sitting here in his home in his final week of life, he is not thinking about his death that's around the corner. He's thinking about the fact he is in the presence of some people that truly loves him the way he loves them. Yes, he realized that his death was soon going to be coming, but his love for you and me and for them was so strong that he pushed it all aside. In Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 8, it says this, Christ who did not count equality with things uh, to be grasped. He simply emptied himself. He humbled himself, and he became obedient unto death, the death upon the cross. The most important thing on God's mind as he was being crucified for the sins of the world was you and me. How much he loves you and me. How much he desires for you and me to be in a relationship with him. This is the same attitude that you and I should have as we do acts of love and service for Christ. One time I was in a Southern Baptist Convention and the former Executive Secretary of the Foreign Mission Board was asked a question about how much it costs to win one person to Jesus on foreign missions. How much money does it cost us to see one lost person come to Christ? I'll never forget the way he said it, his answer. He said, if we divide the number of dollars by the number of baptisms on the mission field, it would probably cost us $17,500. how much it costs for us to see one lost person give their life to Christ. He says, but the cost in terms of steadfastness, long-suffering, and dedicated service of the missionaries could never be measured in any kind of terms of monetary value. He said, love does not count the cost of a life of service to God. How do you put a price tag on the worth of a person's soul? How important is each man, woman, boy, and girl to God that he left the glories of heaven to be born upon this earth, to live among us, to empty himself of all he was, to take upon himself all of the filth and the sins and the needs of the world placed upon himself and willingly went to the cross of Calvary to die for you and me. Why did Mary sit at the feet of Jesus? Because she truly caught a glimpse of who he was and what he was about to do. He knew she was about to experience an act of love unlike any she had ever experienced. And a simple jar of perfume, no matter how costly it was, was nothing in return for what she was about to receive. But what would have happened if God's love had never been expressed? What would have happened to mankind? 
had never been done. How many people have read the Scarlet Letter? The book by Nathaniel Hawthorne called Scarlet Letter. Anybody ever read it? It's in the top 100 books of all time. But very few people probably doesn't know that the book would never have been written if it hadn't have been uh, if it had not been for the love of his wife during one of the most trying times in this man's life. Hawthorne had lost his job. He came home deep in despair. He went through a deep, dark period of depression. Three times he was almost on the verge of committing suicide. But with his wife's understanding and patience and faith and love, she sat down with her husband and she says, you've always wanted to write a book. Now that you've got this free time, why don't you turn that energy from yourself and put your feelings and thoughts onto paper? And let's see what happened. And for the next four months, he poured out his deepest thoughts and emotions and he put it to words on paper. In gratitude, in the forward of his book, he wrote a short note to his wife whose name was Sophia. He said that you have taught me that I have a heart. That my heart was in a dark, deep place. But you, through your love, let a light shine downward and upward into my soul. And you help me see myself as my God sees me. He says, without your love, I would never have really come out of the shadows. But with your love, I have seen my true inner self flicker on a wall and to realize in spite of all my fantasies and all of my mistakes, not only do you love me, with everything you are, but my God loves me as well. What would have happened had his wife not shown him that kind of love? One of the greatest books of all time would never have been written. What would have happened to you and me had God not went to the cross of Calvary and died for us? We would still be lost in our trespasses and our sins. And no matter what efforts we could make, we would never receive forgiveness, restoration, or life in eternity with God. Real love means that you don't count the cost. Secondly, real love always takes the opportunity to act. One of the greatest failures most people in church will experience is this. They never take the opportunity to serve God and their fellow man. Jesus said that even giving a cup of cold water to his name has meaning. We think, well, I really can't sing. I don't have lots of talents. I don't have lots of skills. Whatever. We always make up reasons why we think we're not equipped to serve. But God takes what we're willing to give. Even little things that may be insignificant to you and me are not insignificant to God. God wants for us to take the opportunities we have to do something good for somebody else. Maybe a kind word of encouragement or a pat on the back or the assurance of your prayers or a letter of appreciation, the affirmation uh, of yourself, sitting with somebody at a funeral home, sitting down just next to them. It could be just a simple smile. You can show extraordinary things by a gesture. God gives us opportunity after opportunity after opportunity every day to make a difference in the lives of people. Do we take advantage of it? Mary of Bethany sees the opportunity to express her love to Jesus. 
And Jesus recognized this as an act of anointing his body for burial while he could still appreciate it. He knew that one day he'd be dead. He knew there would not be enough time given for the people to properly cleanse his body, bathe his body, and anoint it for burial. Jesus knew that Mary, right now, had an opportunity to do an act of love that nobody could do for him later. He recognized that while she was washing him and anointing him, she was literally saying to the world in advance, I know you're going to die soon, and I'm doing what I can to help prepare your body for your burial. What Mary did was impulsive. There comes times in our life where we just can't sit down, think about all the angles before we do something. Sometimes there's a need, we just have to rise up and do it. When you watch war movies, where you hear veterans talk about being in a, a foxhole at times, and someone throws a grenade into the foxhole with a group of people, Someone just literally throws their body on top of the grenade and absorbs all the blood. They didn't think about it. They just knew everybody was about to die and they were willing to give their life so that others in the foxhole with them could live. Sometimes we'll sit around and just wait for someone else to rise up and do something about the need. We fail to recognize God's got us planted exactly where He wants and needs for us to be. There may not be anybody else coming down the road. Sometimes we are the only Bible people are going to read. Sometimes we're the only eyes of God that's going to be present or the ears of God present, or the hands of God's present. Sometimes we are where we are at, and we must act out of an impulse because there's nobody else present to do it. And if we don't do it, we miss an opportunity. In the Bible, there's a guy by the name of Felix. Felix is a Roman governor. Paul's been arrested been charged to stand in front of Felix. Felix is standing there looking at Paul. Paul is standing there solid as a rock. Firm in his convictions. Knows what he believes and why he believes what he believes. Felix is standing there trembling. Paul talks about righteousness and temperance and the judgment to come. Felix, standing there in timidness, says, Go your way, for I may have a more convenient season for me to make a decision. And if I have a more convenient time, I will call you. As far as we know, Felix never had another opportunity to accept. He had been given an opportunity. He had heard it. It had touched him. He did not respond. You and I may never have another opportunity to do what we know that God wants us to do. We may not have another opportunity to talk to a loved one, a family, a friend. We may not have another opportunity to right some of the wrongs we've done. We may not have another opportunity to do that thing in mission or ministry or witness that God's been laying upon our heart. Let me tell you a true story. During World War II, a paratrooper was in a, a bomber. The bomber is being shot down. This one individual is able to make it out of the airplane before it crashes he parachutes. He goes to a farmhouse. The Germans are approaching from the woods to come into the Christ site. He goes into this house. He begs the husband and wife that's in there to please hide him. The French people know that if they are caught <coughs> with an American in hiding in their house, Someone will die. The husband and wife 
hide the paratrooper in a box, a wood box, a fire box. The Germans come into the house. They search the house, they ultimately find a wood box, open it up, and the American soldier is in there. They get the American soldier out, they turn to the man of the house, and they shoot him with bullets in the eyes and kill him. The woman is left there devastated because her husband had just been lost. The paratroopers taken to a prisoner of war camp. For the next 18 months, he's a prisoner of war. One night, five of these soldiers was able to escape the prisoner of war camp. And one of them was the paratrooper. They make their way back to our line. He's reassigned. He's reassigned to another bomber. They're on bombing mission. Now, I don't know what the odds would be. His plane is shot down. He parachutes out of the plane. He goes to a farmhouse. And opening up the door is the wife that had watched her husband be shot. Same paratrooper, same home. The Germans are coming. He asked her, will you please hide me? What would you do? Without hesitation, the woman hides him again in the firebox. The Germans come into the house. They ransack the house. This time, they don't check the firebox. His life was spared. This act of selflessness that this woman expressed was expensive. The first time they showed generosity, she lost her husband. This time, had she been caught, she would have lost her own life. But she was willing to take that chance to help somebody in need. The third thing I want to mention to you is this. Mary and Bethany set up a memorial to the Master that's been observed ever since. Each act of extravagant love performed for the Savior is an observance of this memorial of love. The disciples can only count the cost. Judas, who had control of the money box, who didn't use the money box to minister to the needs of poor people, said, let me have control of the money so I can use the money for who? The needy? No. For himself. But Judas's warped mind, all he could consider was the cost. This warped view of life puts a monetary value on everything and every act and never goes beyond the dollar sign. Love can never be measured in monetary terms. Mary loved Jesus so much that she was willing to give him the most valuable thing in life that she had. Now, had the money been spent on the poor, that would have been okay. But when money is spent on the needs of people, with the passing of time, people forget who the poor people were. In this church's 10-year existence, how many people have we helped? A lot. Can we remember them all? If you're like me, most of us can't remember hardly what we did last week. More or less 10 years back. Even Jesus said, the poor you're always going to have around you. The needy are always going to be around you. Do what you can. But Mary knew one great spiritual principle. Jesus would not always be physically near her. He was here right now. And she wasn't going to let this moment pass her by without giving him an act of love and devotion. The poor would always be there. The needs would always be there, but Jesus would not always be there. 
and what she did for him, we're reading about 2,000 years ago. And it's still just as valuable today as it was back then. She gave God her very best. Let me tell you one more true story. There was a lady from Johnson Falls, West Virginia. One of her own. Her name was Sadie Virginia Smith. Sadie grew up on the wrong side of town. She grew up on the wrong side of the tracks. She was never in with the in crowd of her community. She had always worked hard at menial jobs, saving and scraping to get by from day to day, but she would made a promise to her mom when she was a young child that she would save 10% of everything she made. Two, she would give 10% to God, and she would learn how to live on the 80%. <coughs> And from a child, she had always done that. She had done that every day of her life until she hit the age of about 60. And at the age of 60, she decided that she was going to make a once-in-a-lifetime trip. She decided she was going to buy a ticket, get on a ship, cross the ocean, and go live in Europe for six months. Travel to as many countries as she could. So she could say to herself, I was born in West Virginia, but I got to see the world. So she went to Europe. She felt that going on this trip would give her perspective. So when she come back to Johnson Falls, West Virginia, she might get some connection with the in-group and maybe get invited to join the literary guild there. That she could share from her life experiences what they were reading about in the book. Her whole goal of leaving West Virginia to go to Europe was that when I get back, I'll be accepted by the in crowd in my town. While she was on her trip, Guess what happened? World War I broke out. She's caught in the middle of all the fighting. All of the borders are closed. She can't get back on a boat or a train or a plane and come back to the good old United States of America. She spends day and night praying. She goes out into the battlefield to find the wounded and the dying. She says last prayers are fallen. She finds what she can, even ripping her dress into cloths she can use to bandage the wounds. She begins to write scarce letters every now and then back home. Sadie began to find out that her entire value system in life was being reconstructed. After three years in Europe, seeing all the sights, the sounds, the smells, the horrors of war, she finally was able to get her way into France, was able to board a boat to come back to the United States. When she arrived back home, some of her family and friends said, Sadie, I think with all of your experiences, you're going to be invited to join the literary guild. Sadie looked at him and she says, none of those things matters anymore. And they said, what do you mean it doesn't matter anymore? She said, during the last three years, I've learned something very, very important. One, nothing is more important than knowing God, surrendering to God, and living for Him.
two, nothing is more important than taking care of folks that you find yourself surrounded by. Thirdly, that God gave me the greatest gift in life called love. And I am under obligation to give as much of it away as I can. Today is a day when people lined the highway, shouting words of love and admiration to Jesus. They were doing that because they thought he had come to lead them to the military picture. They failed to see that he had come to set up a kingdom. But it wasn't a political kingdom, it was a spiritual kingdom. The same people that this week was yelling in victory chants to him would be on Friday shouting for his death. Today, we can look back and say, what a gift of love that Christ brought to you and me. The question for you and me is this, what are we going to do with that one? Are we just going to hoard it? Keep it all to ourselves? Or are we going to try to let God use us to give it all away? One of these days, we're all going to kick the bucket. I've done, I, I was looking in my books the other night, yeah, how, over all these years of ministry, how many weddings I've done, how many funerals I've done. I've done over a hundred weddings. I've done over three hundred funerals. I've come to learn something that death is coming for every one of us. I've had funerals where people have stood and cried because the loved one was gone and they wonder how we're going to cope. I've had some family members stand there and look into the castle and say, I'm glad you're dead. I've had some that could not begin to enumerate all the things that this individual had meant to them. I've had others to stand and say how much damage this individual had done to people. How selfish they were. Funerals are a powerful thing. You get to learn a lot about the individual and seeing how people respond. One of these days, you and I are going to be in the casket. What are people going to say about us when they kind of pass by? What are they going to say about us as they give us their eulogies? What they say about us is determined by how we've lived our life and what kind of life we've lived. Have we added to the world or have we taken away from it? Did we leave the world a better place to be because we were in it? Or did we make it a better place to be because we're no longer in it? It's not going to be the same one way or the other. And I think God would want for you and me to leave us for a better place to be. And after we pass, they'll know that we were somebody they could be trusted, cared for, respected, who loved, who cared, who shared. If we could be that kind of person, we've caught what Palm Sunday is about. Let's all stand. We're going to sing our closing song of invitation. It's going to be another version of Hosanna. Time to celebrate God's life. Hosanna.